yeah, I think it'd be good if we could practice that song until we get good at it. It's a good song, I think. I like it. It's, a, it's especially hard if you kind of knew it a different way and then you're trying to learn it the right way. All right. <clears throat> well, it's been a blessing to be here, and I'm glad to, glad to see everybody uh, that is here, and our thoughts and prayers go out to those who aren't here uh, today. So, let's stand for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Oh God in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Lord, be with us today, guide us. Uh, ears to hear and a heart to understand be with the brothers and sisters who are out and about today <clears throat> either traveling or preaching or uh, taking care of babies at home or whatever it is that they're doing Lord bless their day as well and minister to their hearts Pray that everything we do and say today can bring honor to your name and, and be edifying to one another. So be with us, Lord. Let your spirit be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I'll start this morning by reading a chapter out of the Revelation of John, chapter 17. As then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell in the earth were made, to, made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, A Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wander? I will try, I will try you. I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind with, which has wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings, Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and in one of and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beasts for one hour. These have one purpose, 
and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by, by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the word of God will be word words of God will be fulfilled the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth <clears throat> i certainly don't claim to have a full and complete understanding of the revelation of john But what we see here is this war between uh, a beast and the lamb, a strife between what's right and what's wrong, between truth, between falsehood, um, between the things of this world and the things of God. And it says that this, this woman who sat on this scarlet beast, who was Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, it says she is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses. The King James translation says the martyrs of Jesus. When John saw this, he wandered greatly. Um, John was accustomed to, by, by his time, he had seen, or I don't know if he saw with his own eyes, but he, the, the, a number of apostles had already been martyred by the time he was writing this. <clears throat> But, but something about what he saw here, like the reality of it, or what, what's really behind all this, just caused him to greatly marvel. <clears throat> the word martyr comes from the Greek word martos which is actually only a few times in the King James translation translated as martyr, and most of the time it's translated as witnesses. It's the same word. When it was written down, when the apostles wrote these books, they would have used the same word. And I want to read to you here in Acts <clears throat> chapter 1. Uh, maybe I'll just start in verse 1. It says, the first account, I, this is Luke writing, he says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by his Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of, of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptizing with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when, you're, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. 
Here's the same word. When, when Jesus is, 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 is telling his 12 disciples, before, just right before he ascends off the earth, he tells them, you will be my martosis, or tuses. You will be my martyrs. You will be my witnesses. <clears throat> the word martyr means one who gives his life for what he believes. But it, it's turned, in our day and age, it has turned into someone, the, word, the meaning of the word has turned into someone who has died for what he believes. And, and we don't really call somebody a martyr until they've actually died for what they believed. And yet, the biblical, the biblical use of it just meant witnesses. To, uh, like witnesses to the faith. People who witnessed who were witnesses of the faith and risked their life and were willing to die for the faith. And like I said earlier, now it, now it gets used usually only once it means someone has died. Are we witnesses or martyrs? Are we... Uh, does it, it starts sounding pretty different if, if we would say... We are his martyrs. Just because we have this different, we have this different concept of what it means, and yet, <clears throat> are we that? Are we willing to die now for the faith? This is, uh, Lord willing, this is the, the the first message to a series of messages that I'd like to give. Uh, about the apostles and how probably all of us here know it, but I think this is something that's probably in, in a lot of Christianity, this may not even be known, that every last one of the apostles died a martyr, as we know the word martyr. He died shedding his blood for his faith. <clears throat> Um, the exception may be the Apostle John, although he was multiple times, he was, they tried to martyr him, but it didn't work. <clears throat> and, and in this series of messages, I'll, I'll try to cover you know, several of the Apostles in each message. I don't know how many, how many messages it'll be yet. <clears throat> when we bear witness of something... We testify of it, that it is so. If we are Christ's witnesses, we testify that he is who he said he is. We testify that he's the Son of God. We testify that he is Lord. We testify that he's a Savior and a Redeemer, that he gives life and gives it more abundantly. We testify that he has the words of life and that he delivers us from sin and bondage. We testify that he suffered and died. We, we testify that when he was reviled, he reviled not again. But he bore it all patiently. And not just with knowledge and words do we testify that, but with our life. What, what value is it <clears throat> if we, with our words, testify or witness that uh, that Jesus is the Savior and has come to deliver us from sin and bondage if we are not delivered from sin and bondage. Or as Joe was saying this morning, like, are we persuaded that he has risen? Are we persuaded that Jesus uh, uh, rose from the dead? How much value is that if we say that with our words, but don't live a risen life? Don't live uh, a life that has, has uh, not, not only with the hope of the resurrection after this, but that has rose from the things that pertain to death, which is sin, because the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> It's 
being witnesses of the one who said, The servant is not above his master. The apostle is not greater than he who sent him. Menos Simmons wrote, If the head had to suffer torture and pain, how shall his members expect peace? And these apostles found this out. If they didn't understand it right away when Jesus said this before he left, like if, he did, if they didn't understand when he said, you are my witnesses, that he meant you are my martyrs, you are the ones who are going to suffer, they soon found it out. <clears throat> They ended up drinking of the same cup. And through much tribulation, they entered the kingdom. Not only by being witnesses of his life, but being witnesses also of his death. They testified by what they lived and how they died that Jesus Christ was here in the flesh and laid down his life leaving an example for us. And the joy and the hope in which they did this testified or was a witness that the joy and the hope in which they suffered this persecution <clears throat> was a witness of the promise of the resurrection they witnessed in Christ. Not only was martyrdom something that endured, they saw it as a great honor. After all, had their Lord, who they were being witnesses to, not said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. The Apostle Peter also wrote, But and if, but, and if we suffer for righteousness sake, happy are we. Now sometimes people in search of honor uh, try to bring persecution upon themselves and they miss it. Although it's not right, although it's not wrong for us, as, as Paul said that he did, to, to, to beat our body into subjection and bring it into subjection so that we wouldn't be a castaway. Although that's right for us to discipline ourselves and, and to and, and to we could say, like, whip our bodies into subjection. Think, think about that for just a little bit. Nobody looks at Paul's life and says, man, this guy just kind of, he kind of pursued ease and pleasure. I mean, he suffered so much, and yet toward the end of his life, he writes this thing that even to this day, I beat my body into subjection. <clears throat> Lest at the end, I've preached in vain and end up being a castaway. Although that's right, there's nothing wrong with that. The same Lord who said, blessed are you when you're persecuted, also said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. <clears throat> and we'll see, we'll see, I think, by the life of the apostles, that they were not in search. It, it was not in their search for honor that they were persecuted. <clears throat> but in their love and service to Christ that they were honored with martyrdom. It was love that carried them through, a love that's powerful. Paul wrote, I think, in second second uh, letter to the Corinthians, he says something like, the more that I love, the less I am loved. Love is not always received. It is not always received as such because it's accompanied with truth. And it hurts sometimes. When John the Baptist loved Herod enough to tell him that it is not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife, it ended up costing his head. Adolf Hitler said that love is weak and hate is strong. But he was wrong. In his hate and tyranny, he died and his reign ended. 
But Christ's apostles, his witnesses, died in their love and their reign began. In 2 Timothy it says, if we, be, if, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. In Romans, Paul wrote this. <clears throat> Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, peril, or the sword? Just as it is written, for your sakes we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These things could not separate his witnesses or martyrs from God's love. None of these things. <clears throat> All right. Well, and I'm going to I'm going to cover I think more than just the 12 apostles in this in this series. I'm going to start with Stephen. I'm going to try to go through these in in chronological order in the order that they died. <clears throat> um and I'll Lord willing, I'll cover some some of the other people that weren't necessarily the twelve apostles, but like Mark and Luke, um, maybe Barnabas, some some of the men that we read of here <clears throat> that were also his witnesses here in the Bible. I don't know how many of you, maybe all of you, have a martyr's mirror in your home. But most of these apostles, there's pictures that go with them. I, I'm going to pass these around. You can pass them around. This is Stephen. Um, when I was young, before reading was reading was hard for me. I it was work. I wasn't a a speedy reader at all. And and uh, but I would look at my dad's martyr's mare. Um, just just to look at the pictures, and as they say, pictures a picture speaks a thousand words. And I, I would just look and look at those pictures because I thought they were so powerful. I thought there was so much, so much of a story behind it. <clears throat> and it was many years later that I actually, before I actually started reading. Uh, reading what was written with, with those pictures. Stephen, uh, after Christ, Stephen was the first witness that sealed his faith with his blood. And we really don't know anything about his former life. He first appears, his name first appears in Acts chapter 6. And then, the very next chapter, we read of his death. <clears throat> I'll read Acts chapter 6. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing... In number, a complaint arose on part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, 
whom we may put in charge of this task. <clears throat> but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Perminus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And, those, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what, what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses and said, This man in incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. And the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And then, and then Stephen goes on to, to give this long defense, you might call it, in chapter 7. <clears throat> we notice here that people... Uh, there were there were envious people, people that induced people to say false things about Stephen. <clears throat> that's that's pretty hurtful, and it it happens <clears throat> it happens that people people spread false accusations against us, and it it hurts. It just, and what's our response to it? Does it make us sad or does it make us mad? Uh, do, we, do we think that that means I've got to set this thing straight? Uh, just, just remember that false, false accusations have been a part of what God's people have had to endure Christ himself had to endure it. And when he was falsely accused there, when, when, when he was, um, that night before he was persecuted, he didn't even open his mouth. <clears throat> Just know this, that, that false accusations are normal for Christians. <clears throat> I'm not saying that, that that means we have no place to try to set something straight, but just remember that it's normal. It should not surprise us. When someone lives a blameless life, and he's living not of this world, he's living above the standards of this world, it's bound to create suspicion. This person is not normal, and so the normal thing to do is to, to create some false accusation against him. Especially when, like Stephen, you're unable to cope with the wisdom in which he speaks. <clears throat> Notice that though Stephen gave a long defense, it had nothing to do with trying to save his face, or his character, or himself. 
It was simply a long defense that he gave, starting with Abraham and why, and, and he just gave this long story out of, out of the history of the Jews, like what, what really is going, what really is it that we see here that happened? When, when, when God started bringing Abraham out, and then what happened with Moses, and what happened there in the wilderness, and all these things. <clears throat> and with it, uh, he, he was defending the gospel, and with many of these scriptures, he exposed this whole Sanhedrin for what they really were. A bloodthirsty and power-hungry group of people who were children of the persecutors of the righteous. There in chapter 7, starting in verse 51, he gets to this point, kind of to this climax, where he says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robe at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen, as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. <clears throat> he saw the Son of God standing there at the right hand of God. I, I don't know where this originates. Probably some, I don't know, I've heard it since I was young, but that <clears throat> that this this may be the very only place where where it talks about Jesus or the Son of God standing at the right hand of of the throne or of God. Like usually it says, he took his seat on the right hand of God, or he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, or something like that. And here here he's standing, and and the the thought that has 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 been had is that. Christ couldn't stay sitting like his his something like you know when when somebody <clears throat> if if you're a sports if you'd be a sports fan I I hope you're not but if you are or have been like if 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 something really uh dramatic is like maybe just at the end of the game and your team is just ready to win it the people, the fans, the fanatics, that's the, did you know that that's the, the word fans comes from the word fanatics? Yeah, these people are fanatics. Anyway, they can't stay sitting. Like, they're up on their feet because it's a victory. And I, something like, I don't even really want to compare Jesus to, like, sports fanatics. But at the same time, like, he's standing there. His, his faithful witness is ready to go all the way. This is a great, great victory. <clears throat> Under the Roman law, Stephen's death was illegal. The Sanhedrin was not authorized to impose the death penalty, but the stoning appears to have been the result of a mob reaction. <clears throat> Later, Paul would say, and this man, this, this young man named Saul, who, who the people put their coats on. I, Saul was a pretty, he was a pretty uppity man. He was, he was, I think above the dignity of, 
of bending down and picking up stones to throw at somebody, but he blessed this thing. He was, he was the man who everybody laid his, their coats at his feet and did the dirty work. He, but, but he was happy to see it happen. <clears throat> maybe, he, uh, maybe he ordered it. At any rate, he was there. This same Saul, after his conversion, said, And when the blood of your witnesses, of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by, appointing, approving, and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. The martyr's mirror ends up saying this yet. It says, Such was the end of this upright man, Stephen, to whom the honor of Jesus Christ was dearer than his own life. It is stated to have taken place in the year 34, after the birth of Christ, in the 19th year of the reign Tiberius, which was the 38th year of his age. It happened in the seventh year after the baptism of Christ, this having occurred, some God-fearing men attended to the body and carried it to the grave, greatly lamenting this pious martyr. The stones were to him as rivers of sweetness. <clears throat> the next one of these witnesses to die was James, the son of Zebedee. James is John's brother, the son of Zebedee, and if I understand this correctly, Zebedee is Joseph's brother, the husband of Mary. And so, James and John would be first cousins to the household of Joseph and Mary, um, it would be first cousins to Jesus and, and his brothers and sisters who were born to Joseph and Mary. And so I, I assume that Jesus was, he basically grew up with his cousins, I imagine, um, and knew them well from boyhood. Although I, I think for sure John was much younger than Jesus, and I think James was slightly younger than Jesus. <clears throat> Um, and we read in Matthew chapter 4 of how, how, how it was that they began to follow Christ. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 18 in Matthew says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. <clears throat> he was called to something greater, and he, ab he abandoned his fishing, his father, his family business, to follow Christ, and little did he know where this would lead him. He was one of those. He was one of those three disciples who was included in almost every one of Jesus' remarkable occasions. Um, it was often Peter, James, and John who were invited to, like, up on the Mount of Transfiguration, or in even even. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I think, I think he called those three. It'd be this James and Peter and John. He, he called them to come closer yet to him to witness his sufferings. They, they fell asleep, but, but he was called to it.
he was one of he was this James is one of the people one of the two I think two I think that I read somewhere that there were three disciples but I couldn't I couldn't find it in scripture that were called the sons of thunder I think it was according to scripture it sounds like it was just James and his brother John um He gave him the name, I don't know, Boonerges or something like that, which means sons of thunder. And it doesn't really tell us why they got that name. Like, it's, uh, is it a good thing? Like, I guess it's a good thing because it says, it says that Jesus gave him that name. I don't think it was something like <clears throat> that. Like, Jesus gave Peter the name Cephas, which was a good thing. He was, he was a rock. He was, uh, and he gave them this name that they are the sons of thunder. <clears throat> um, they were men of power, I think, and love. We'll talk about John later on, but consider like how John, like when you read John's, especially his epistles, like he, he says some powerfully strong things uh, against heretics, against false people. And, and yet he's, he's considered the, the loved one. He's the apostle of love. I, I think John is a super good example of, of, of a man who brought together the completeness of like Standing for truth with love. <clears throat> but this, this account is about James, his brother. Pretty sure James is his older brother. <clears throat> uh, there's one account that we read in this, this, this account, uh, I think, has to do with their thunder-like character. In Luke chapter 9, In verse 51, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers <clears throat> on ahead of him, and they went and entered the village of a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. I think I, I think this this village of the Samaritans was en route the way he wanted to go, and he sent messengers ahead. I I'm reading into this, but I think to, to see if they could make place for him for the night, for him and his disciples. Could you, you know, could you lie, lodge a man and 12 disciples here somewhere? And uh, Samaria was oftentimes at enmity with the Jews. But they did not receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciple James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. <clears throat> They were the type of people at this point yet. They, they wanted justice. They wanted vengeance. They wanted the, the, the wicked people to receive their due punishment. <clears throat> the time came when, J when James received the Holy Spirit and he too was not about destroying people but saving people. Another interesting account about James before that happened, before Pentecost, um, is in Mark chapter 10. Verses 35 um, to 40, I think I'll read. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you... Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? 
And they said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. Now just a note, when this, when this account is given in Matthew, it makes it sound like, well, yeah, it makes it sound like their mother came to Jesus and said, I have a request for you. And he asks what it is, and she says, Grant that these two sons of mine um, can sit at your, one on your right hand and one on your left. <clears throat> I, have a, I have a feeling it probably was the mother that asked the question, but that James and John were in on it. Um, they, they, they wanted it. Maybe they even wanted the mother to ask it. And it's, it's a common thing for us to, uh, for, for parents to, they want to see their children honored. And so, and so sometimes they take fleshly measures to try to push them into a, a position of honor and they don't understand the honor of God. <clears throat> what if, what if Jesus dumped it all out to her and said, yeah, they'll be honored. They'll be beheaded. They'll be killed in very gruesome ways. That's how they'll be honored. She would have probably, she would have not comprehended it. And Jesus didn't say that. But he goes on to say, <clears throat> you do not know what you were asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left, that is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it was, has been prepared. <clears throat> At this point, they were seeking honor yet. James was seeking honor. But he didn't know, or they had the thought that that, that, would, that would mean by being first, by being the greatest, uh, by being the closest to the king. Like if a king has a throne, those men that he keeps closest to him are his, his favorites, his most honored ones. That's what they wanted. One that would help rule, one that would help this king rule. One that would help this king judge. That seems to be the way the, these sons of thunder were. <clears throat> the ones that would help, help set things straight, right? That's not altogether a bad desire, but in God's kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last first. The servants are leaders, and the lowly are great, and the persecuted are the honored ones. He was one of these that was there when Jesus said, You are my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem till the end, remotest parts of the earth. You are my martos, my martyrs, my witnesses. Some, history, some historians have it that, that sometime between this and his death that he traveled to Spain. I think it's a little uncertain whether that's a fact or not says, but he met with little success and then returned to Jerusalem. The account in Scripture of James's death is very brief. It's in Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now about this time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that, it pleased the Jews. He proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. James was one who preached or witnessed of the truth of the gospel throughout Judea. I read one account that said he preached in Samaria, although I couldn't Verify that in scripture. Maybe it's there and maybe it's just a historical fact or a historical thing. That, but, but I thought if so, isn't that interesting? Like remember, 
he was going through a village of Samaria earlier, and, and because something didn't strike him well about the Samaritans, he was like, could we just ask fire down to destroy him? Now, now he's going to these Samaritans to, to preach the good news of the gospel. <clears throat> History has it that the person, his executioner, apparently before he actually the, the person who was meant to be his executioner, or maybe it was the one who sentenced him to death, it wouldn't be the one who actually like swung the sword, but was so moved by, his, by, by James that he himself converted to Christianity. This is what it says <clears throat> uh, in the Martyr's Mirror. It says, the apostle lived only until the fourth year. This apostle only lived until the fourth year of the Emperor Claudius, at which time Agabus had predicted that there should be a dearth throughout all the world. At that time, Claudius charged Herod Agrippa to suppress the Church of Christ. Then Herod laid his blood, bloody hands on this apostle and on, on the, and on the feast of the Passover put him in prison. Shortly afterwards, he was sentenced to death and executed with the sword in Jerusalem. This occurred in the year 45 after the birth of Christ. Clemens relates that the executioner, seeing his innocence, was converted to the Christian faith and died with him. According to the annotation of Eusebius Pamphilius from Clemens of Alexandria, of, from Clemens of Alexandria, the executioner was so moved on account of his death, of the death of James, that he professed himself to be a Christian. And so, as he states, both were led forth together to death. As they were led out, the executioner asked James to forgive him. And James, after a little deliberation, said, Peace be with thee, and kissed him. And thus, both were beheaded. Again, we see a new, we see a new man. Uh, we see a man who, instead of asking fire on his executioner, kissed him and said, peace be with you. There's two things. I read this quote one time. This may not be perfectly quoted, but it says two things that always follow true Christianity. One, they will always be persecuted. And two, they will always love their persecutors. <clears throat> the next man, the next of the apostles to be martyred was Philip. He was one of the apostles, and we read about him, his beginnings of following Christ in the first chapter of John. I'll start reading in verse 43. It says, the next day he proposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was, was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. <clears throat> he too was just, was called uh, by Christ to come follow him, and immediately he followed. Um, just, it's such a, such a blessing how we read this of Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John, and Philip, and Matthew. And, and I'm not sure about the other apostles, if we even really read like when and where Christ called them. If we do, I can't remember if this is said of him, but it just, they just, 
They just got up from whatever they were doing. I mean, Matthew sat at the customs collecting tax money and, and Jesus says, come follow me. And he leaves it and he goes and follows him. Peter and Andrew are fishing and he says, come follow me. And, he, and they leave everything there and they go follow him. So does um, James and John. And here, it doesn't tell us what, what Philip was doing, but Jesus said, follow me. Not only did he get up and follow him, he immediately goes to his friend Nathaniel and says, we found him. Come and see. <clears throat> he remained faithful and followed Christ. He was not offended by his hard sayings like many other disciples were. In John 6, he's the one that Jesus counseled with about how to feed the multitude. Uh, how, how shall we feed this multitude with, with bread? And Philip seems like kind of a practically minded man. He said, well, 200 pennies worth of bread is not enough to feed this multitude. Um, he's also the one who in, in John 14, he said, show us the Father and it is enough for us. To where Jesus explained, have I, not, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? <clears throat> In Acts chapter 8, We now read here of Philip. He was, a, he was one who seems to have done a lot of traveling and took the gospel to a lot of different places. <clears throat> In verse 4 it says, Therefore those who had been scattered went, out, went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Again, here's a man who's going to Samaria, a people who for the most part are despised by the Jews because they're not full-blooded Jews. The Samaritans, if I remember right or understand right, they were that, they were the people who when, 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 when Israel went out of Egypt, it says, um, how many, was it 600,000? I think 600,000 men um, without the wives and children, and a mixed multitude. I think that mixed multitude, I think, is a lot of what the people who lived in the Samaritan cities, they were, not, they were part Jews, not full-blooded Jews, despised by the Jews. The Jews were too, they were too elite. They were too, they thought themselves too high to, um, to have much appreciation for someone who was not just like them. <clears throat> Something that Jesus really came and, uh, cut at the roots of yeah, Joseph. Not just that they were a full-blooded Jews. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. Good point. <clears throat> Um, says the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was, was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. <clears throat> Philip was the one who baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and interestingly, as I was thinking about that this morning and reading about it, he, he uh, remember, he's, he's Christ's witness. He's, he uh, believes that to follow Christ means to expect, expect what Christ found in his life. And so he... he um, 
he finds this Ethiopian eunuch. God directs him or tells him to go on this certain street, and then, then he sees this, this carriage going by, and he says, God says, make, get yourself up to that. And he ran up to this, to this, this carriage and <clears throat> found this Ethiopian. And this Ethiopian was reading in the prophet Isaiah, and he was reading the part, the passage of Scripture that says, he was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch was puzzled and asking Philip, Who is this writer writing about? Is he writing about himself or is he writing about something, someone else? And he started there, Philip started there to preach Christ to him. Uh, and, and that is what this passage is. It is about Christ, and yet later on Philip will find himself as his witness, being led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shears. <clears throat> he taught several years in Scythia. He planted many churches. Syria was the upper part Syria and the upper part of Asia fell to his share and he laid the foundations of faith in many of those cities. He finally came to Phrygia and wrought several signs in Hierapolis. There the Ebionites, who not only denied the divinity of Christ but also worshiped idols. If I, if I understand right, the Ebionites were um, I think they held to a lot of Jewish beliefs and accepted some Christian beliefs but did not believe that Jesus uh, did not believe in the divinity of Christ and they worshipped idols. <clears throat> and he continued Obstinately, obstinately, no, let me re restart that sentence. There the Ebionites, who not only denied the divinity of Christ, but also worshipped idols, continued obstinately in the blasphemous doctrine and idolatry, and did not listen to this pious apostle of Christ, but apprehended him, and, made, and having made his head fast to a pillar, stoned him, whereupon death ensued, and he thus fell asleep in the Lord. His body was buried in the aforementioned city, Hierapolis. <clears throat> that happened about in the year of 54 A.D. It says they, I don't know, the, the picture makes it look like he maybe had long enough hair that they took their hair and tied him to a pillar. Somehow they tied his head to a pillar. So that he was, you know, just strapped there and couldn't move. And then they stoned him to death. As we read, those are the three witnesses that I'm going to talk about today. As we read there in Revelations chapter 17, this war has been going, it always will be going. This war between the dragon, the beast, the harlot, and the lamb and his saints... I think, I've read and I think that Abel was the very first martyr. The very first witness of God. Even though he's long before Christ I think that the church has always been, and I know there's I know there's there's the thought that the church started at Pentecost, but church simply means it, it comes from the Greek word ecclesia. It simply means a called out assembly, and the word church, this word ecclesia, 
was used hundreds of times in the Greek, Greek Septuagint in the Old Testament. It's not like a new term that, that Jesus introduced. It just simply means the called out assembly of God. In, in uh, Hebrews, maybe I'll read a portion of Hebrews, but there after Hebrews 11 where it talks about all these people who out of the Old Testament who by faith did such and such, you know in verse chapter 12 it starts saying, now being compassed by such a great cloud of witnesses. These people were also witnesses. They were also martos. They were also martyrs, you might say. <clears throat> Some of them, even in the sense that we know the word today. In verse 32 in Hebrews 11 it says, And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon and Barak and Sam Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises and shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourging, yes, also chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, and all these having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God has, had provided something better for us, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. We will die as we live. The question is not, would we die for our faith? The question is, have we died for the faith? The question is not, would we endure being stoned? The question is, have we fallen on the stone and been broken? already the question is not would we be martyrs or witnesses the question is are we his martyrs or witnesses it is easier to die a martyr's death than to live a martyr's life all I have on this first message, Lord willing, will continue this series for a little while. Um, we'll open it up to share. Anybody has any comments or corrections? So the, the Martus, um, I'm pretty sure it just like literally means witness and that the, um, the life-giving part of it is, a, is kind of something that it's been turned into or uh, evolved into um, or it's the, it's the implication like the way, um, like the way we might say uh, well, we believe, but if if you really believe, then then there'll be fruit, as though you know belief without fruit. And then I noticed, like when I looked up, when I looked it up, like the it, it often says his uh, when it says witnesses, it often says true witnesses, like not just somebody that would attest to something, but somebody who like with this implication of like would truly attest like with their whole life um, 
I mean, I'm open. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, requesting correction there, but I think like, like literally the Greek, like when we see that word, like um, it says like the, the, the witnesses put their, I think it says put their coats at, laid their coats at Saul's feet. And it's just that same, you know, there, in, in, in most of the Greek, in most of the places, like it's just somebody like in a courtroom or something, and it, they're not necessarily giving their life, or that, that that's not even implied. It's just it's just somebody who saw something or testifies of something. But but um, but if it's a witness of a true witness of Christ, like someone who's truly seen or who truly testifies of that of Christ, um, God's Christ, you know, then. This is the implication of what what will follow, and um, I'm inviting correction for that. But just to to be clear, and um, that uh, that the modern transliteration of the Greek, the Martus, has um, it, its definition that that we've come to give it is by uh, is by implication, and, and maybe was not necessarily there when the writers wrote it. That, um, and had, to be, had has become an implied or a given um, definition later. And then with that, oh, I thought of the importance of like the two things that go together, like that some, like we talk about Seems, seems like being born again comes up a lot, but like being born again implies that like um, it's a new life, and that implies that um, it's not a changed life, it's not a reformed life that God calls us to, but an entirely new one, um, an, a termination of the previous one. Um, he didn't he, uh, he didn't come to re, uh, reform Judaism, but to that. That that would end in a person's life, and uh, he didn't come to fix the old covenant. He came to call people out of that one and into a new one. Um, and so, um, the uh, part, a very important part of the power of the new life, comes from the termination of the old one, and not just that we do. We don't just add Christianity to our American life, but we terminate our American life and, and have a new, you know, a new nation, a new kingdom. Um, and not just that we, I um, feel like I just keep saying the same thing over and over. We, it's not that we just do new things, but, we, but, the, but essential that we quit doing um, old things, um, whether it's Judaism or Americanism or what, whatever it has to be. Um, or whatever it was, um, this is, I think, the implication behind the new birth or the new and the new life, um, and this uh, not just um, okay. So not just uh, a literal physical death, because I think even um, I th- you haven't gotten to John yet, but it, did he did he die of old age, Dwayne? Do you know that already? Yeah, I, I thought that was the die of old age. Yeah, I thought that was the history, um, and surely he was a faithful witness. So the um, the thing I kind of want to add to the definition is that um, uh, it's a it's a um, a witness that's so strong that even if it costs our life, we will still say no other things than the truth. Like, if, it's, it's, all, it's implied, if we're put in this position, like, if men are going to stone you because you won't back down, you won't back, like, you're going to not back down no matter what. Like, may, like, I would say here in America, we're not in that position where it costs us um, our literal lives, for the most part. Um, but, but the implication is, whatever it costs, in whatever circumstance, we will pay that we will give that even unto our physical lives, but 
like we're, we're, we're not in a position right now that, that they were in and, and somehow John escaped, that I, I doubt, I mean, I'm just certain it wasn't because like he, um, he was some, sometime faced with it and backed down, um, but, but rather just that we wouldn't back down. And that, um, and so, and so in that, like, it's just what, um, not just that we'd be willing to die someday, but today, whatever it costs, whatever death it costs us today, our job, our pride, our reputation, on and on, um, whether it's in our house, um, or on the street, or at our job, um, anyway, just wanted to say that, and then the, um, picked out these several things and then I, re I recognize that they're all kind of connected and then the, the 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 hate is strong love is weak thing like I I, I can't I don't want to say too much about the comparison but I, I do want to recognize the strength of hate and its proper place in our hearts um, we just like God doesn't call us not to hate but he uh, he calls us to hate the right things he wants us to hate the things that he hates and to deal with them um, properly, like we, we should be, we should have a hate for our old ways, a hate for our old lives, a hate, like we recognize selfishness within ourselves, that there is strength in, in that hatred, it just needs to be properly applied, it should not be applied to our fellow man, like that hatred should not be applied to, to people, um, but rather um, these other, the, these other things like, you know, in uh, just the first thing that came to mind is just what Christ said, whoever doesn't hate his father, his mother, his own life, like there, there is strength and there is power in, in the hatred, but it needs to be applied to those things that are, that are at enmity with love. Um, and then the, um, oh, the, and then the Ecclesia, I wanted to speak about Ecclesia, the ek is the, is the out part and the, the Kalia part is um, is the called. So it's um, it uh, it in a the the, the the Greeks even before there was such a thing as what we call the church or, or Christianity. If I understand right, the Greek definition would just be somebody who who um, was said, "Hey, come over here," and, and we're gonna and the, uh, and then and then the implication is like um, like a search party or a, a political party. Um, people who have gathered together like in unity for a purpose that's implied but the the important part is that they um, they didn't just uh, they didn't just necessarily do they didn't just maintain their unity individually but they came out of whatever they were away from wherever they were to be together um, and unified now it wouldn't just be <coughs> physical necessarily but here Anyway, I just like noticed this pattern of the things that I caught that that, that stuck out to me was just this, um, not just a devotion to a cause, but the uh, the, the great importance of the, the the termination of something previous or the departure from something uh, previous. Um, so there would be that there would in in the way we would use the word church there'd be many different kinds of churches you know we're talking about the ecclesia of Christ those were called out from where they were unto Christ um, and then you know, i would say uh, figurative, figuratively or po poetically that people could be born again unto this or that but like the thing that that is important is like born again unto Christ the life uh, the new life is 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 the Christ life um Anyway, I just, for whatever reason, maybe it's part of my personality, I just really latched on to the fact that to, to, to not, just, um, not just live a life, but make sure that the previous life is, is dead and not just, not just love the new things, but be sure that we do, in fact, hate, literally hate the old things and not just that um, we've, we've come onto something, but that we've come apart um, from other things. Um, I get... I guess I learned it when I was a Baptist. Somebody would talk about. I guess it was when maybe if somebody would talk about um, or call, oh, maybe to harshness of preaching and like that. And I, I, th I think maybe that we were. But I, I, there was a principle that I felt like I couldn't argue with. And some, 
somebody said something, you don't really, you don't really love the little girl unless you hate the snake that's about to bite her. Um, and so, um, like I have, uh, uh, if, I, if I really love something, then the implication is that I, I hate anything that's against that something. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm at war against whatever is against the things that I love. And um, Anyway, for some reason, that, 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 that other side of the coin really stuck out to me this morning. Thank you, Brother Dwayne. Uh, you had so many good points, and uh, I'll make two quick comments, I hope. Uh, one would be, when you were a little boy and you kept looking at those pictures, the modern mirror, well, I'm a, an older boy. I never saw The Passion of Christ, but I have that book picked up at a thrift store for a list, I don't know, whatever. But in the cover, now and then, when Sarah's not looking or somebody, I open it up, and I look where they're, they're lying him down, and they're hammering the nails and I, I just, it just wants, like you said, the uh, suffering of, of Christ. Uh, and then as you quoted, Brother Twain, you know, he gave us an example to follow. But I, 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 I do that just to, to get in my peanut brain what the eternal being, Son of God, had to go through or chose to go through for our sake. It's just a phylactery. So I know you were a little boy, you liked those pictures. I still like it, and I'll probably keep looking at that picture until I die. But uh, anyway, always, the, what's the verse that Paul says? Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. The Lord be magnified. Uh, one, one small point uh, about, you, you mentioned, Dwayne, about, uh, well, uh, persecution or, or ridicule or something. Someone says, when you drive, when you get in, if you go into a, a car, a car dealer, and you get a, uh, a new automobile, as soon as you drive it out of the parking lot, they say it devalues like $3,000. Is that true? As soon as you just ride it for a couple of miles, say I paid 30000 for it, and then you drive it just around the block, it's yours, it, it goes down like 3000 The analogy is, as soon as we, we, we elected by the Walter and Dwayne and Norman as leaders, and we're all behind them, at least I think it is, it's great, I think we're doing a great job, but as soon as you become leaders, you're going to have people are going to start criticizing you, even when you haven't done anything. It's just so natural to criticize just for being a leader. And that's something that uh, I'm glad that you and Walter, you, you, you have to let the bobs jump off you. You, you can't have thin, thin skin and let people, uh, people you know, uh, 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 skier you away or try to uh, do that. It's, Groups that don't have leaders will eventually fall. But as being a leader, you and Walter, and if we have other, you have to <clears throat> recognize that you will be persecuted. Whether you do, whether you don't, they're going to say bad things. The Lord be magnified.